And so with that, I'll just uh, introduce Dr. Soros. She is an associate director of the at the um, Climate Change Institute at the University of Maine. We're also very pleased that she's on the board of directors at Maine Lakes. Um, she is a, a professor of paleoenology. She serves as the associate director of the Institute. She's director of the Sawyer Water Research Lab. Uh, she does lots of great things around water and um, teaching and students and uh, lots of really interesting research. I think you've all probably read her bio as it went through the loop, so I won't read it verbatim. But needless to say, we're really honored that she was able to speak to this group and we are very happy to have her. So I, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. Thanks, Susan. I'll just get my screen set up here. That looks good. All right, all yours. Great, thank you. So yeah, as the title of my talk suggests, what I'm gonna start out discussing is the concept of lakes as sentinels of climate change. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the complexity of that and some of the ways that we try to organize our thinking about how climate affects lake ecosystems. And then I'm gonna spend most of the talk going through some of the climate-driven changes that we've observed in Maine lakes. So just to start out with the concept of lakes as sentinels of environmental change more broadly than climate change, um, it's pretty well recognized. We know that lakes are very sensitive ecosystems and the concept of lakes as sentinels is really saying that there's some of the systems where we see the first measurable change in response to some driver. So in other words, um, whether it's something like pollution or climate change, uh, lakes are the first system where we can actually measure and detect some ecosystem changes um, compared to what we're seeing on the landscape. And a key reason for that is because they're the lowest point in the landscape and they also integrate a lot of that information from their watersheds or the landscape around them and the air shed around them. So they really are sort of collectors of a lot of the information um, coming off of the watershed and air shed. One of the other advantages with lakes is that they do archive signals in their sediments. And so I will show a little bit of that today in that we can take sediment cores from lakes and we can look at fossils or chemical signatures in those sediments. And it helps us to see what was going on in the past and um, really document then um, how lakes and, and perhaps the broader landscape have been responding to environmental change and, and climate change. And so just to think a little bit more about this concept of lakes as sentinels, before we think about them as sentinels of climate change, we can look at them as sentinels of, of some other types of environmental change. And so in particular, um, this shows you um, the response to nitrogen deposition in the Western United States. Um, nitrogen deposition is of course something happening all over the place and it's been pretty well studied in a lot of areas and the Western US is, is one of those areas. And so this diagram is just showing you the amount of nitrogen deposition. So it's increasing as we move up the axis here and then some different types of ecosystem responses and when they happen um, along that nitrogen deposition gradient. And what you can see is that the first two responses, so the responses that happen and that can be quantified at the lowest amount of nitrogen deposition are responses in lake ecosystems. And so even at very low nitrogen deposition rates in these Western lakes, we can see a change in algal species in lakes. And then with a bit more nitrogen deposition, we can see measurable changes in lake water chemistry. And it takes even more deposition then to start to see measurable changes in the landscape around a lake. And so this is, this is what we're thinking about when we think about lakes as being sentinels, some of the early warnings, some of the first measurable changes in response to a driver. 
And the same is true when we think about climate change. We do know that lakes are very sensitive to climate change. We also know that their response to climate is more complicated than what we often see um, with, with other types of drivers. So there's quite a bit of complexity. And um, this, this diagram attempts to show some of the different types of um, ways in which lakes respond to climate. And so we're looking at different forms of climate response enforcing with um, radiation essentially, uh, or radiance I should say, um, air temperature and precipitation, and then some of the effects, um, physical, chemical, and biological that we see subsequently in lake systems. And this figure is a big oversimplification. We know that there are many different ways that uh, climate can affect lake ecosystems and these responses. And there's a lot of interaction that goes on around these responses with each other as well. So it is a, a complex um, response that we see when we're looking at the response of lakes to climate. We also know, of course, that there are other drivers simultaneously changing, um, you know, over the 20th century and into the 21st century, we're not only seeing climate change, but we're seeing changes in atmospheric chemistry, changes in land use, invasive species introductions, all sorts of things. And so um, when we're trying to distill some of the complexity down and trying to identify how climate is changing lake ecosystems, um, we've developed some additional conceptual diagrams to try to think about this. And so there's one model that came out from Blankner in 2005 that attempts to figure out, well, why do you see so much variability in how lakes respond to climate? And essentially what this model is trying to show is you've got climate change and variability and ultimately working its way down to a lake ecosystem response. And, and how is that signal sort of shaped as it moves from, from climate, the driver, um, to the lake ecosystem response. And so um, Blankner proposed that you can think of it in a way um, through these filters. And so there's the landscape filter where the effect of climate um, acts on the landscape. Um, and so depending on where the lake is um, in terms of its you know, um, latitude, longitude, altitude, those types of things, depending on what the catchment or the watershed looks like in terms of the bedrock and the type of vegetation. You know, these things can all shape the signal that's coming um, through. And then the lake features themselves also play an important role. And then ultimately shaping what we see in terms of the lake ecosystem response. And so this is one way to, to help sort of organize thinking about how climate can influence lake ecosystem responses. There's another model that came out a little bit after that, and this was by um, Peter Lovett and others, and it, it's similar in some ways to the Blankner model. Um, it's just a slightly different way of organizing your thinking about it. And you can see again, we've got the, the landscape and the lake um, as, as um, components here, but then um, the climate drivers are separated out in terms of whether they fall into a category of energy or mass. And it sounds a little uh, textbook, I guess I would say, but when you actually put um, words onto this, um, I think it starts to make a little more sense in that, you know, we think about some of the energy drivers. And so thinking about energy acting on a lake system, you know, we're talking about things like changes in temperature, solar radiation, and wind. And when we think about mass inputs, so material inputs, to lakes, we're largely talking about things that are being driven by precipitation changes. So an influx of nutrients, organic carbon, and particulate material. Um, so this, this has been fairly useful as well, I would say, um, in terms of trying to think about the different ways that climate affects lakes and thinking about how some of, um, you know, changes in these sort of energy inputs and changes in mass inputs can drive different types of responses in lakes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to essentially break up my talk um, along the lines of energy and mass, but really what I'm talking about first is some of the effects of temperature changes, and then I'll talk about one particular type of effect that we're seeing as a consequence in part of precipitation changes. 
So thinking now more specifically about Maine and starting off with some of these temperature, energy type um, driven changes, uh, we can take a look first of all just at the average annual air temperatures in Maine and what they've been doing over time. And this comes from Maine's Climate Future, the um, reports that um, Fernandez and others have led out of the Climate Change Institute at UMaine. And you can download these reports off of the Climate Change Institute website. Um, and so this is just showing you, as, as we all know, um, the, the warming that has occurred um, over the last 100 plus years, and also how that warming has accelerated even further um, over recent decades. So this gives you a perspective over about 100 plus years. And as a paleolimnologist, I like to make sure we, we also think about it over an even longer time scale. So this is a global temperature record, a, a largely a reconstruction, um, which is what the proxy-based record suggests. And then there's also an instrumental record on the end here. And um, again, we've got that rapid warming that occurred um, starting at the end of the 19th century. But I just like to um, note that, you know, if you go further back in time here, this is coming um, on the end of the Little Ice Age. So we had a cooler period for hundreds of years. Um, and then in the um, mid 1800s, that period ended. And then we saw this rapid warming subsequently. So I think it's just some good context to have um, not only looking at the, the very recent rapid warming, but also that this, this um, comes after a cool period. So thinking about some of the changes then that we've seen in Maine's lakes, um, there was a great study that came out from Hodgkins and others in 2002, showing that the timing of ice out in the spring has become earlier in Maine's lakes. And again, you can see we're basically coming out of the little ice age here from 1850 on, and you get into that rapid warming during the 20th century and subsequently the advance of ice out on Maine's lake ecosystems. We know that changes in ice off dates are highly coherent across lakes in a region. And so this is just showing you a couple of the records that come from the uh, two lakes in the county. And you can see that these two lakes are actually quite different in terms of their surface area and maximum depth. And even so, if you look at the changes in the timing of ice off, they're quite similar um, across these two lakes over time. And it makes sense when you think about um, how you know, changes in ice out are fairly directly driven by climate. So it's one of the um, it's one of the more direct responses, I guess I would say, um, to energy changes, to lake systems. And so um, it's not too surprising that we see a, a pretty high degree of coherence um, in this response of lakes. We can think more about what's happening with lake temperatures. And there's a lot of different ways that you can look at temperature changes in lakes. And we look at it in all these different ways because Biologically, there are a lot of, um, there are a number of important ways of looking at how temperature changes in lakes. So um, this is just showing you the, the typical stratified, you know, thermally stratified lake in Maine in the summertime. So we're looking at the um, moving deeper in the lake and we've got um, stratification and we've got the surface layer, the epilimnion being the relatively warm, well mixed layer, the metalimnion, where we have this sort of transition to cooler waters in the hypolimnion. And so um, I'm gonna talk a bit about what's been happening to temperatures in some of these different layers. And then also I'll talk a bit about what's been happening to the strength of this stratification. So if we look first of all, just at um, mean, and also near surface temperatures of lakes in the Northeast. You can see there's um, a number of lakes in the Northeast and many of them in Maine that were part of this, this um, data set that was used in this paper. And what we're seeing, these, these plots, just to explain them a little bit, um, we're looking at the, we're basically looking at a couple different slices of time. Um, 
you don't have to pay too much attention to the two cohorts necessarily. It's basically just showing that some of these lakes had data back to 1975 and some of them only had data back to 1985. So that's why they're separated out here, but they're all compared to what then um, subsequently happened um, in, um, the, in ar around 2012. And um, comparing the values then across these time points, the slope, if you're at a positive slope, it means that that parameter has increased. So what we're seeing here is that the near surface temperatures in these lakes have increased over that time frame, and it's significant, which is indicated by these stars. The deep water temperatures did not change in these particular lakes, and the mean temperature did increase, likely as a consequence of um, this increase in the near surface temperatures. Um, in that study, the Richardson study, I'll just go back to it for a second. As I said, the deep water temperatures did not change. Um, we released a, a paper this year, well, actually last year now, <laughs> um, looking at global trends in deep water temperatures. And we had one lake in Maine that was included in this. So um, Jordan Pond actually was included. And just to say that we've seen variable trends in deep water temperatures. Um, and you can see that in this figure to some extent here, just that there's been some variability in terms of what's been happening with deep water temperatures. And when you think back to that Blankner conceptual model where you've got those filters um, through which the climate signal passes, um, you know, you think about temperatures down in the deep water and the hypolimnion, um, you know, those filters really come into play when you think about the signal um, going through within lake um, processes and, and being modified a bit. Um, and you tend to see some variability across lake systems. And so in this particular study, we did find that the deep water trends um, had a lot to do with the lake surface area and also the concentration of dissolved organic carbon in the lake system. So some within lake factors that definitely modify the, the signal that you're seeing. We can think a bit more about lake thermal structure. So this is just another way of looking at a temperature profile in a lake. Again, we're going down in depth here. And this is um, late spring going through summer and then into fall. And you know what you would typically see in the dimictic or uh, um, a lake that stratifies during the summertime. In the spring, we've got you know, mixing and then a start to stratification that can easily be broken until you warm up to some point. And then you've got um, warmer surface waters during the summer and then this turnover again in the fall. And you know we're pretty interested generally as limnologists in terms of what's happening with lake thermal structure. Um, you know, absolute temperature differences are important, certainly. Um, but when we think about lake thermal structure, it has a lot to do with the quality of lake habitat. And so things like, you know, how thick is this warm surface mix layer? Um, there's a lot of biological activity that happens in that surface warm layer. Um, there's also, and you know, the, the hypolimnion is also very important. Um, the cold, deep waters usually, well, sometimes oxygen rich, sometimes not so oxygen rich. So the um, thermal stratification plays a strong role in, in shaping the habitat here. And so we're concerned with how is that structure changing um, and what can that tell us about how lake habitat might be changing. And so if we look again at this Richardson study that was um, based on this whole suite of lakes in the Northeast, this again is our near surface and mean temperatures that we saw before. Um, and in this study, we also looked at temperature differences across the surface layer and the bottom layer. And what you can see is that that difference has also increased significantly across these lakes. So in other words, um, you know, even warmer in the surface, cooler um, in the bottom waters. And again, this is, in this case, it's largely being driven by the warming in the surface waters. Um, and then we see a number of other metrics that are used to describe stratification 
but they're all essentially indicating that the strength of stratification has increased in these lakes over this time. We actually have some tools to reconstruct lake thermal stratification. And so while our monitoring data tend to go back, um, you know, sometimes to the 1970s, sometimes further, um, we're limited, of course, in what we've got before that time frame. And so that's where paleolimnology can come in really nicely and help us to better understand longer term changes in lake ecosystems and, and how climate has played a role in driving those changes. And so we can take a sediment core from the bottom of the lake and you're basically then going back in time as you move down the sediment core. And one of the tools that we use to reconstruct actually a number of things from lake sediments are diatoms. And so diatoms are a type of algae. They're very um, abundant typically in lake ecosystems and they respond rapidly to changes in their environment. And we know that, that certain species can be used as indicators of, um, well, lots of different things. There are certain species that are indicators of pH changes, others that tend to respond more to climate-driven changes, and others that tend to respond more to nutrient changes. So um, we can use their fossils, which are left behind in the sediments, to reconstruct some of those um, different changes that have been happening. And we often look at changes in the assemblages. So in other words, changes in the whole group of species, but sometimes we just look at changes in particular species. And so we have developed tools to use diatoms to reconstruct lake thermal structure. And um, essentially, you know, this is just showing you that we use lots of different lines of evidence to try to understand the ecology of these organisms and then apply that ecology to our sediment record. And so we look across lots of different lakes to try to see how species are distributed. We conduct small scale experiments where we manipulate one or two variables at a time and, and look at the response of diatoms. And then we can also do whole lake experiments. Um, in this case, I'm showing you a, an experiment where we change the thermal structure of a lake and we look to see how did that affect the species in that particular lake system. And so we pull those types of experiments and observations together and develop models um, to apply to our lake sediment records. And in this case, this is showing you three different species that all vary in terms of, of their distribution with respect to lake thermal structure. So some species like Discostellus delidra that flourish when um, the mixed layer is shallow and other species like this Lindavia intermedia that fares well when you have deep mixing conditions. So I'll show you just a couple records from Maine just to um, give you an idea of, of some of the changes we've seen and the timing of those changes based on the sediment records. And so we've got records from Tunk Lake and also Sebago Lake. And in these sediment cores, again, you're, you're going back in time as you move down the core. And I'm just focusing on two species here. Um, there are two species that are essentially end members along the lake thermal structure gradient. And so Discostellus delidra being abundant when you have shallow mixing and Alacosiris subarcta being more abundant when you have deep mixing or completely turned over conditions in a lake system. And this is showing you that since about 1850 in both Tunk Lake and also Sebago Lake, we've seen a shift to shallower stratification in these systems based on the sediment records here. Um, we've also looked at this in Highland and Long Lakes. Um, these are the, the lakes that the Lake Environmental Association um, uh, works on. And I'm just showing the record from Highland Lake. The one from Long is quite similar in terms of the timing of changes and also the, the species that are present. So I just figured I'd show one just as an example here. And now you're seeing more species um, on the plot here. And again, we're going back in time as we move down the core. And this time we're going back to 1600. And these are all relative abundances of the species. 
and um, this side of the diagram is is basically showing you how the different assemblages sort of cluster out. So where are the differences in these assemblages over time? And the red lines are where we have significant changes in the community. And what you can see is that there was a significant change in the diatom communities in the early 1700s. And you see the same thing in Long Lake. It coincides with major land use changes where there was clearance and agriculture initiated. And then you see some shifts occurring in this case around 1935 and also again in 1980. And these shifts are um, essentially happening or they're attributed to what we're seeing in terms of this Discostella stelligera species and a number of the Alacosira taxa here. And so what this is suggesting is that there have been some changes here as well in thermal structure. And this is suggesting we're getting shallower stratification in the 19, roughly 1930s and a shift again to shallower in about 1980. So some evidence from this record um, during the 20th century in particular, that there were some climate driven changes occurring um, in these these diatom records and it suggests that that much of this is being driven by changes in thermal structure in these systems. So in Maine Lakes we've seen a number of these so you know energy driven changes occurring over different time scales. Um, we've seen a number of changes based on monitoring records over um, recent decades and then looking at the ice out record and also some of our paleo records you can see a number of climate driven changes occurring over time in Maine's lakes. We can also think then about precipitation driven changes. And so this gets at more of the mass side of that um, diagram that I was showing you before and the idea of the influx of materials. Um, so a different type of effect here. And so again, looking at Maine's climate future report, um, drawing out of the 2020 update. This is what's been happening in terms of annual precipitation in Maine. And again, this acceleration um, since about 1960 in terms of the increase in precipitation on an annual basis. We also know that there have been increased extreme precipitation events in the Northeastern US, um, at least over the last um, 60 to 70 years or so. And you can see how the Northeast compares um, to other parts of the United States. So unfortunately, a model area um, of some of the greatest change in the intensity and frequency of rain events. There are a lot of definitions for extreme rain events and they vary quite a bit from area to area. And I think they're constantly being revised as well um, as we're experiencing stronger and stronger climate change. Um, but based on this report, I believe it was one inch per 24 hour period. If you exceed that, you're looking at a, a, um, a extreme event in precipitation. So there are a number of different materials that precipitation will um, you know, flush into a lake ecosystem. Certainly nutrients are a key concern, um, also sediments and um, we hear a lot about nutrients and sediment and they're very important in lake systems. And I think it's great that the Lake Smart program has a, a strong focus on those factors and also has been integrating the perspective of changing precipitation and, and changing storm frequency in um, their program as well. So I won't speak about that today. I figured I would talk about something a little different and give you a, another perspective. And that is um, thinking about the contributions of dissolved organic carbon into lake ecosystems and what we're seeing um, on that front. And so when we think about dissolved organic carbon, this is organic carbon that results from the decomposition of plant and animal material on the, mostly on the watershed. There is some dissolved organic carbon produced within lakes as well, certainly. But for most lake ecosystems, the majority of it is coming in from the watershed. So it's produced here, it's a natural material, and then it is washed into lake ecosystems and other surface waters. And it imparts that brown color 
to lakes that I'm sure many of you are familiar with looking at main lakes. <clears throat> Um, DOC is a, a very important material in lake ecosystems. It plays a big role in regulating lake ecosystems. So um, it has received a lot of attention over the last 30 years in particular in lakes. And it, it's more and more, it's part of regular monitoring of lake ecosystems. In terms of the, the role that it plays in lakes, it plays a strong um, role in terms of light um, and so water transparency. And so in a lower DOC system, we see light penetrating further compared to a browner, higher DOC system. And because of that, we see that um, DOC plays a role in heat absorption and also um, setting up lake stratification. And so you can see that here with the shallower light penetration, um, you're actually seeing a shallower um, thermocline setting up in these systems. Um, we know that there are drinking water implications with DOC. DOC serves as a carbon source for heterotrophic bacteria, so that's a concern when we're thinking about drinking water. And importantly, some of the chemical treatment processes for drinking water actually can interact with DOC and produce harmful byproducts. And so it is a concern when we're thinking about drinking water um, in our state, especially because we do have a number of lakes that serve as drinking water sources. And DOC is also um, part of what we call the nutrient color paradigm of lake production. And so many of you are probably familiar, of course, with total phosphorus and how that influences lake production, going from um, oligotrophic or low productivity systems on the low end of the total phosphorus gradient to a higher phosphorus eutrophic sort of system. Um, DOC basically adds the light dimension then um, when we're thinking about production. As we think about algal production, nutrients are one component of it and light is another key component. And so as you increase DOC, you're starting to reduce light availability. And so on the low end of the total phosphorus gradient, we see um, lakes that are what we call dystrophic. So they're low productivity in brown. And then on the higher end, so where we have high, t high total phosphorus and higher DOC, um, we're looking at what we call mixotrophic lakes, which are commonly referred to as murky systems. Um, so they're both sort of um, brown and green, I guess, at the same time. Um, there was a study that came out a couple years ago that indicated um, across the United States, the number of um, lakes that have transitioned over into being murky has actually gone up by about 10%. So it is a, a, a growing um, type of lake um, in broadly across the United States. Generally speaking, we do know that there have been widespread increases in DOC in recent decades, and this is referred to as browning. This is a study that came out a while ago, basically just um, generally showing that in the Northeast, Eastern Canada, and then um, in Scandinavia and the UK, we've been seeing this trend towards increasing DOC in lake ecosystems. And if we look specifically at some lakes in Maine, the same is true here. Um, this is a data set that comes from Acadia National Park. And um, Acadia, it's one of the few areas where we actually have DOC measurements in the state that go back to 1995. So it's a um, really nice data set for looking at DOC changes. And um, so we're going 1995 to 2008 in these diagrams. And you can see this increase in DOC um, in a number of these systems over this time frame. So similar to what we're seeing broadly in many parts of the Northern Hemisphere, we're also seeing this in Maine. And as I mentioned, um, with DOC, uh, that influences water transparency. And so this is just showing you the secchi depth. Um, we're starting at the surface of the lake here. So moving down, you would have a clearer lake. And this is 1995 to 2008 on this side of the diagram. So where we have the increases in DOC, we're seeing um, a decline in water transparency over that same time frame, And this has been happening in a number of lakes in Acadia. 
likely a number of lakes in Maine as well. Um, but this is where we actually have the, the measurements of DOC to accompany it. Um, we think this increase in DOC is actually a sign of recovery from acid deposition. So this is a positive development in that um, you know, the legislation actually works. Um, there's been a reduction in acid deposition. And um, just thinking about the connection with, with DOC, um, we know that the solubility of DOC in soils is dependent on the pH and ionic strength of soils. And there's um, basically just um, a bit of a description of this process in the diagram here. But the bottom line is that if you see a decline in acid deposition, um, you see an increase in pH and a decrease in ionic strength of soils that increases the solubility of DOC and therefore increases its flux into surface waters. So we think this is the primary reason why we're seeing a change in DOC. But there's also an interaction and, and a, an effect, I guess I'll just say, of precipitation itself. So, so whether we're talking about you know, certainly the chemistry of precipitation, but then also just the sheer amount of precipitation and also the timing of that precipitation is important. And so I just thought I'd show you a couple examples of this um, from work in our, our work in this region. And so looking at um, a whole suite of lakes in um, the Northeast and looking at some different time slices, we looked at uh, DOC deviation from the mean for two particular years, 2001 as a dry year and 2005 as a wet year um, compared to sort of the average and um, just comparing these two years, you can see um, in the dry year, lakes typically had lower DOC concentrations. And in the wetter year, or the wet year, I should just say, um, we see higher concentrations of DOC in these lakes. So that's looking at it on an annual basis. I'm thinking about um, how each year kind of compares to the average. We can also look at storm events since there's been a concern about what's happening with increased um, frequency of extreme storms. And this is showing you six different lakes. These are actually all drinking water lakes. And we're looking at a number of different storm events. And we have measurements of um, DOC before the storm in each case, and then at three time points after the storm. Um, and this happens within a, a three week period. So P3 is three weeks after the storm. And um, we're looking at the relative response of DOC. So in other words, how does it compare to the pre-value, pre-storm value, pre value um, what happens after that? So we can see a number of different types of responses across these lakes. We see um, some cases where there's a strong response and then it quickly um, dissipates. Some uh, responses where we see a, you know, a modest increase, but it's sustained over time. And then other cases where there's, there's really not much of a response at all. And we think this is largely being shaped by the residence time in these lakes. So how quickly water um, is essentially flushed out of these systems. And I just wanna talk about this a little bit more um, to wrap up and, and because I want to just talk a little bit about some of the management implications because of course you know adapting to climate change is a, is a very important priority um, and I talked a little bit just mentioned very briefly the whole Lake Smart program and how they're adapting which I think is great and so I thought I'd just give another example here and so um, this is just essentially trying to distill some of the changes that we saw in the previous slide into a conceptual diagram and you can disregard the purple lines. I won't talk about the purple lines here, but the black ones are the DOC concentration, similar to what I was showing on the previous diagram. And so we have um, a lake with a short residence time where you get that, that initial peak and then a drop again in DOC with, with a storm. Um, lakes with moderate residence time, essentially um, showing a, a modest increase, but it's sustained. Sorry, I'm I should be following the black line. And then um, in cases like this, where you saw essentially no change in DOC, these are lakes with a longer residence time. And so thinking about then, you know, how do we 
modify management strategies in light of some of these changes? Um, well, the management strategy is going to depend quite a bit on, you know, the shape of these responses here. And so thinking about, you know, where you have a maybe an intense but brief-lived change in DOC in a case like this, um, you know, we may need to think about stronger temporary adjustments to um, drinking water treatments. If you have a, a modest, a moderate, I guess I'll say, um, increase, but that's sustained, um, this might require milder treatments, but, but over a longer time period. And where you're seeing very little change, at least in terms of the DOC um, concentration, um, you know, monitoring and continuing to, to think about this is probably a good idea since, um, you know, the, there is still potential for it to change at some point. So, okay, so just to summarize then, um, basically I just wanted to provide an overview of some of the different ways in which climate has driven lake ecosystem responses in Maine. Uh, we've seen things like earlier spring ice out, increasing lake surface water temperatures and strength of stratification, and a, um, a shift to shallower summer stratification, changes in lake water DOC and water clarity. Um, I, I hope you've seen that monitoring these changes is pretty essential for thinking about how we adapt management strategies to continue to protect Maine's lakes. And also that there's a, a role for paleoliminological studies to provide a longer term perspective on these features. And in some cases to provide some good baseline information as we're thinking about targets um, and what's, what we can achieve um, as we're trying to adapt to change. So with that, I will end and move to questions. Thanks so much, um, Jasmine. I've heard your similar talk before, but every time I listen, I've heard it two times before, but every time I listen to it, I hear something new and something different that I didn't pick up on before. Um, and you also do an amazing job of answering my answering my questions as I um, as I think of them, you answer them. So, so far we don't have any questions from folks, but um, for folks listening in, feel free to either uh, to type in your questions and um, we can pass them right on. Um, I'll ask a question about sort of the, D the DOC, um, you know, that it's, it's a good thing because it's a sign of recovery is, and there's a, is there any interaction with phosphorus in terms of those two interacting with each other? Or are they sort of in their own little silos doing their own thing to lake water quality? No, there is an interaction. That's a great question. Um, so we often talk about dissolved organic carbon, uh, largely because that's technically what we measure um, as far as you know, the, the actual analytical process is measuring carbon. But carbon doesn't travel alone. <laughs> carbon, of course, organic carbon often um, is complexed with other uh, materials and phosphorus is definitely one of those materials. And so we do see um, organic forms of phosphorus coming in with DOC, which we just broadly call it dissolved organic material. And um, that is an area of research where, you know, we think about how does dissolved organic material shape ecosystems, shape lake ecosystems? One of the key things has to do with light, but then more and more we're paying attention to what nutrients are coming with it and how is that fertilizing lakes as well? And I would argue the phosphorus, the organic phosphorus coming in is actually more readily available than like the nitrogen component of um, that organic material. So it definitely can be an important source of phosphorus. Is there, I know one of the um, things that I was just reviewing a document on forestry practices and, you know, the idea of for, you know, leaving trees, of course, around shorelines and stream along streams to provide shade and to provide those leaves that fall into lakes to provide kind of the basis for a food, for the food chain for insects and algae and all those things that's, that, that, you know, that those fallen leaves are really important. Is there any time when leaving fallen leaves, leaving 
too many leaves in a lake, does that um, contribute to, uh, can you have too much? I mean, eventually that would lead to carbon in the, a source of carbon in the lake. Can you have too much? I don't know if I would say that about leaves necessarily, because they do degrade fairly slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I haven't heard that as an issue. Okay. Um, that's a good question though. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think we all want to encourage people to leave those overhanging branches and um, as a source, but as you were talking, I thought, hmm, maybe is there a time where that would be bad? Um, but I hope not because we we're telling people to yeah. do that. Not to my um, knowledge. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of our listeners wanted to know what the implications are for having a shallower uh, sort of epilimnion in the summer, that top layer of water, having yeah. that be shallower. What does that mean for lake health and lake life? Yeah. So when it's shallower, um, what ends up happening sometimes is that the, the nutrients actually can be depleted faster in that shallower layer. Um, and you can see then that production sometimes moves deeper um, into the lake system. Um, the shallower it is, the other um, constraint, I guess I would say, is thinking about um, for animals like zooplankton and fish, you have a shallower warm layer that can be optimal for their biological activity. Um, so zooplankton, of course, they come up to the surface at night to feed because it's warmer and because there's often more resources um, in the, the um, surface of the lake. But um, so, you know, when you um, constrain that zone a little bit more for some of the animals, it's, it's not as favorable, I guess I'll say. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, a question about uh, Secchi di disc readings, and you know, that's how we're measuring a water quality and Tristan's on this, is listening and I think he's still here. Um, he may have something to say about this, but um, how does the dissolved and the, br the brownness of the water, the color and that, you know, that murkiness, it, you showed the Secchi readings going, I have to remember, they got smaller, right? Because that smaller is bad. It they got smaller yeah. in murky yeah. water. Um, so Secchi discs are really, read, Secchi discs readings are really um, affected by DOC. So yeah. how do you, I guess, what do you do then? If you're measuring Secchi disc, you're not really not, you're measuring multiple things. And how do we figure out if you're reading a phos of an impact from phosphorus and algae versus an impact from color, changing color from dissolved oxygen. Yeah. Dissolved the, organic carbon. Yeah. With a Secchi disc, I, um, I think you'd have trouble, you know, separating that out. Um, and, and that's one of the great things about a Secchi disc too, is it integrates, um, hmm. you know, it integrates everything you're seeing or not seeing um, in the lake. Um, whereas if you, um, it, you can actually measure dissolved organic carbon, you can measure color, um, you can measure chlorophyll and separate it out that way, which is what we typically do, but it looks like um, maybe there's an answer in the chat as well. Yeah, so Tristan says he has some clarification. So if he is willing, I'm going to, um, Tristan, I hope this is okay. I'm gonna promote you to panelist. So he'll pop over here and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear from him, assuming that's all right with you. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Are you there, Tristan? Hi there. I am. Hey. I don't have a camera, unfortunately, um, just the headset, but... Um, oh, well, thanks for talking to us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, uh, Jasmine, I'll let you finish what you were saying before I jump in. <laughs> I think I was done. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so our big, our biggest clarification on this is that um, since we are really looking at the long range data set for a lake with our volunteers, if, if a volunteer is noticing that there is a lot uh, more 
dissolved organic matter, you know, the murky quality of the lake um, developing, then that is something that we sort of anecdotally pick up on. Between lakes, there's obviously a lot of variation. And so in that way, the Secchi disks are, if you have a high DOC lake versus a lake that it does not, you know, they're, they're not really comparable in, in that, as Jasmine was saying, you know, it integrates it. So, um, yeah, I would say that it's, it's sort of, it's sort of not the intent to pick up on the differentiation um, with the Secchi itself, but it does play into our review of lakes as we are um, viewing them. And, you know, if a volunteer does see a big change, then uh, that is something that we <laughs> will look at further. And we do uh, color tests um, during uh, both DEP and um, we will do color tests if we think that there's a, a need to do that. And DEP does it during its baseline. Great. Thanks. Thanks for jumping in and sharing that. Absolutely. Um, uh, we don't have any other questions unless somebody wants, this is your last chance. Um, and we're right on time. It's getting close to five. So uh, with that, I'll just say thanks, Jasmine, for speaking. Uh, thanks for everybody for listening. And hope we see most of you in two weeks. We have, um, that'll actually be our last talk. Um, uh, and it will be a good one on cyanobacteria. So hope to see you there. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jasmine. Thanks.